Hello and welcome to this video and this video is going to be called The Murderer Who Invented Woke or it might be called The Murderer That Created Woke. Anyway, however you say it, it's a very clickbaity title isn't it because it's got the word woke in and it's got the word woke associated with a murderer and uh, the term woke is such a divisive term in our culture at the moment um, but it shows the power of this person that we invented this concept. Now, the guy that came up with this, who first said it and, and, and um, first pushed it into um, modern culture, was also one of the most important musicians of the 20th century that seems to have influenced and affected so many different styles of music right up into the modern day. And of course, I am talking about Huddy Ledbetter, better known as Lead Belly, right? Now this guy, had, is, he, he um, holds such a unique place in music history. This isn't someone that sort of emerged, started playing their songs, you know, be, uh, became successful in their local area, signed a record deal, became a big success and popular, sold made millions of records and has now become a legendary musician. He didn't go that route at all. This is a guy that ended up in prison for murder, right? and through a bizarre um, sequence of events ended up getting known as the singing murderer and the representation of this um, ancient um, um, Afro-American and American folk music history, right? And I'm going to get onto that in a minute. It, but it's a fascinating story when you look at the story of Leadbelly. Um, and I really wanted to try and show how this guy, right, who died in 949, how his influence on our modern culture is still so massively relevant. So when I say that this, this guy was a murderer who invented woke, that is a statement of fact. You know, words ushered, uh, uh, uttered sorry, by Leadbelly 80, 90 years ago, right, are still having a huge effect on our culture. And what this shows is the history of music. Now, we, this is what I love to do. I love to come on and talk about the history of music, history of jazz, history of blues, history of rock music, history of prog. I love to come on here and talk about it. And often I'm talking in general sort of um, statements, you know, trying to get a picture of the whole sitting back. But they're actually, the history of music is created by individuals and it's created by individuals in a really nuanced and strange way. And I think the story of uh, Lead Belly really illustrates that. So let's start at the right at the beginning. Uh, Huddy Ledbetter was born in 1988. Perhaps um, on his gravestone and on various other documents, it says 1989. Okay? We don't know when this guy was born. And the reason is, is because we're going back to a point of, in history in America at the end of the 19th century, which is clouded, right? Um, he grew up working on the plantation, that, um, standard story you would expect uh, from an Afro-American at that time. He starts playing music, uh, singing folk songs, and by the turn of the uh, 20th century, he's an established musician who's going around and playing, right? So this guy is going right back, right back in history to a point in time that is opaque to us. Now, the reason it's opaque is because the history of 20th century music, popular music, is the history of the recorded music industry. When recordings, i.e. records, and then the, later on the radio emerged, we were then able to properly uh, document folk music forms, right? Which were impossible, they can't be written down like classical music. And so once those records emerged, they became incredibly popular. The um, commercial constraints at the time meant that certain music forms came to the fore. Um, really, blues and jazz, they became the popular music forms in the 1920s and 1930s. But those two forms were created out of a big sort of, um, you know, melting pot of different music, right? All sorts of different um, people in the 19th century in America were playing all sorts of different music and America at that time was not only a melting pot of culture but they also had this cultural like bomb go off which was you know the um, the slave trade and the civil war um, 
the displacements of Africans into America, the take, taking away of their culture, but having a, a memory of that culture and then that culture mixing with so many different folk forms, you know, um, Scottish music, Irish music, Spanish music, marching band music, classical music, all these things are stirring together. And a lot of the musicians that were touring around in, in America in the late 19th century were um, performing all this type of music and all this type of music goes into this sort of new um, Afro-American form of music which is then um, uh, it, it's promulgated through minstrelsy. So this um, music has its roots in this um, oppression of Afro-American people, right? Um, but the truth is all these different influences are there. Um, a lot of blues songs, when you trace actually where the song comes like, it will go back to Scotland. They're Scottish folk songs or they're Irish folk songs. Um, when this music started to be recorded in the 1920s, as I said, the commercial constraints meant that people wanted to record blues and jazz. That's what was selling records. And, and this history, this, this folk history, gets lost. There's no recordings to go back to. We're not really hearing any blues, folk, jazz or anything to the 1920s, right? So um, what's interesting with Lead Belly is he emerges, you know, by 1903 we know he's traveling around playing music and he will be playing a type of music that is not called blues and it's not called jazz and it's an amalgamation of all these forms of music. Exactly like the great Buddy Bolden in jazz, you know, Buddy Bolden was a New Orleans musician that wasn't playing jazz because jazz didn't exist and he himself pulled together all these different things in New Orleans, all these different folk forms and forms it into this music that eventually gets named jazz because that's the label that the record companies want to put on it to sell it. It's always been like this. Now, Lead Belly is an interesting character because he, we have got a musician now that goes right back early, okay? And he's going around and playing, but in the, um, the mid-teens, uh, 19-teens, right, he gets um, arrested and he gets put on a chain gang, right? So he's, he's taken into prison. His music career is cut short. He, he um, escapes from that chain gang and then ends up murdering his cousin in a fight over a woman. This happens around about 1919. And this starts a long series of, of um, prison terms. And um, even though Lead Belly sounds like he was a bit of a sort of alcoholic, violent man, <laughs> um, once he gets into a prison, he's a model prisoner and he entertains them by singing these folk forms. Now, one of the things that's interesting here, here is him going into prison and not being part of the music industry, not being part of that emerging thing that's going on. Um, it sort of uh, um, freezes what he was doing, right? It freezes these folk songs, okay? Um, as he was coming up, he worked alongside an, a legend of blues, which was Blind Lemon Jefferson. Blind Lemon Jefferson, when he signed, right, and the way Blind Lemon Jefferson signed is really interesting, you know, the record companies were, were like, we need some blues musicians, we're selling these records, and um, they sent a phone call down to a record shop, I think, and uh, this guy said, well, there's a guy outside here, he's like busking outside, and they went and grabbed Blind Lemon Jefferson and they signed him. Now Blind Lemon Jefferson was playing all these different types of music, you know, the ragtime, the marching band music, the folk music, all these different things telling stories. But once he signed the deal, it was primarily the blues stuff that he signed and the other stuff got lost. Of course, Blind Lemon Jefferson then dies, I think around about 1925 and his legacy is done. Not the same with Lead Belly. Lead Belly is now sit sat in a prison, all right? As these blues and jazz forms emerge, people start to realize that there is a history there and there's a mystery around this history. So um, they go, right, we need to find out what's going on. And there were two guys, um, father and son, John and Alan Lomax. And they decide to go down to the south and try and find these musicians and try and um, you know, work out what's historically gone on and try and store this because they recognize and it's, it's, a, it's an incredible thing that they did at that time. They, re, they recognise the artistic importance of this. So they, they go around all the prisons, and they go around all the different prisons, and they you know, listen to musicians sing songs, and they can document their songs. And then they run into Lead Belly, who's sat in prison. Now, Lead Belly 
is not only an incredible singer with this sonorous, you know, um, rich baritone, he's also a virtuoso uh, mu musician. He plays all sorts of instruments, but he's playing a 12-string guitar. And he's playing this 12-string guitar like nobody else. He's actually used to market himself as the greatest 12-string guitarist, you know. Um, this guy's a virtuoso musician. Now, I think this is something that gets lost. When the story's told, it's like, oh, they found this sort of itinerant musician that, that, that knew the songs. No, Lead Belly was a genius musician and they recognised his incredible talent, which was sophisticated. He'd learned his craft. They recognised this and... Um, He's actually coming up for parole at the time. There is a legend that he sung his way out of prison. That's why they released him. That's not quite the case. But I think the brilliance of his singing did influence um, them al allowing his um, parole. And he comes out of prison. And John and Alan Lomax um, sort of take, take him under their wing, right? Um, this is in the middle of the Depression. You know, when he leaves prison, he can't find any work so he starts working for John Lomax as his chauffeur and he travels around and, and they put him on singing his songs and he starts to get um, fame right and this fame he's getting is from a completely different route right he's been listened to by sort of an educated middle class elite as well as Afro-American people everybody seeming see hear, seeing and hearing him you know, and they're bringing him out. At this time, he's coming out dressed in a prison uniform with a ball and chain around his um, leg, playing all these ancient folk songs from the 19th century. And it causes a sensation, okay? Now, let's get on to the woke bit. Um, in 1931, there was um, a criminal case that's become known as the Scottsboro Boys. Um, there was a train travelling with um, a mixture of uh, white and black people. And the white people, lovely that they were at that time, decided to try and kick the black people out, all right? And the black people didn't retaliate, there was nothing that went on, but by the time the train got into the station, there, there was like a sort of, um, you know, um, what were they called, you know? There was a, a party of people ready to grab these these black guys and um, accused them of all sorts of things and they got accused of rape they there was no evidence for this it was completely unfounded but at that time it was a snap decision and these guys were put on trial some of them were sentenced to death some of them were sentenced to long prison terms um, the NAACP and the Communist Party actually got involved and and they got the retrials and, and, and some of these sentences were toned down um, and some of these people were um, actually, um, uh, their, their sentences were overturned, you know, because even when witnesses who'd said they'd raped these girls was turned around and said, well, no, we made that up. They, the the, the, the uh, racist um, world that they lived in at that time, people were still pushing to get these guys in prison or executed, okay? It was an absolute travesty. It's a real example of what was going on to Afro-American uh, Afro people in the South at that time. Um, many people think that the, uh, the book To Kill a Mockingbird was um, influenced by that story. And it wasn't, but Harper Lee was aware of it. And she did say, you know, it was those types of stories that influenced the making of that book, right? Um, Led Belly sang a, a, he wrote a lot of songs that discussed things that were going on at the time. Um, there's an incredible song about the Titanic, um, which uh, tells the story of how the great black heavyweight boxer Jack Johnson was not allowed to get on the Titanic. Now that's not actually true either. It was another ship um, that uh, he wasn't allowed on but there Led Belly was was writing songs about things that were going on at that time and he wrote a song called Scottsboro Boys and in that there is a lyric that says this he says this he's, he's singing the song and then he starts talking and he says I made this little song about down there he's obviously referring to the deep south so I advise everybody be a little careful Best stay woke. Keep their eyes open. Right? 
That is the first utterance of the term woke in terms of being aware of social injustice, right? Um, now, the question is, why, why was Lead Belly's work, which wasn't massively successful at the time, why has it had such a cultural influence? Now, I want to talk about that so you really get an idea of this. Um, Lead Belly influenced Pete Seeger a Woody Guthrie, and in turn influenced Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan is perhaps the most important musician in the history of rock music. He ch changed his rock music for, from a sort of a novelty version of rhythm and blues and country, you know, which is all about driving around in cars, you know, and uh, chatting up girls and having a good time. Dylan makes um, popular music serious, and that directly comes from Lead Belly. He covered Le Lead Belly's tunes and Dylan said that without Lead Belly, he wouldn't have got an interest in folk music, right? Now that's enough. That is enough to show that Lead Belly really created rock music as we know it. But here in the UK, there was a huge artist in the 1950s called Lonnie Donegan and he started off the skiffle move movement with a song called Rock Island Line, which is a Lead Belly song. Lonnie Donegan was basically like an English version of Lead Belly and he created this skiffle movement and out of that came people like the Beatles, there came people like the Rolling Stones. Um, if you go on the internet you'll find a video of a very young Jimmy Page talking about his love of skiffle and he saw himself as a skiffle musician. All those British rock bands were started off because of skiffle and skiffle entirely started off because of Lead Belly. There's an incredible quote where a George Harrison says, no Lead Belly, no Beatles, right? Um, the influence on, say, a band like Led Zeppelin is evidenced in the um, song Gallows Pole, right? Gallows Pole is a song written by Lead Belly again, which tells the story of someone who's about to be executed and they're waiting someone to arrive, I think like a girlfriend, with some money to, to get them off the uh, hangman's noose. It's an incredible song. And that song goes directly into Lead Belly's actual experience, okay? So you start to see that this influence is incredible. Most people who know Lead Belly now, they know it from the performance of In the Pines, which was retitled um, Where Did You Sleep Last Night, that uh, Nirvana performed on the Unplugged um, concert. Uh, Kurt Cobain was a huge um, fan of Lead Belly. Uh, he um, stated he was one of the most important musicians to his development. So we can see the influence of Lead Belly on Nirvana. Um, now, you might be thinking, well, I don't know any of these songs, do I? Right, think of um, Black Betty by the, uh, you know, right, Ram Jam Band, right? That's a Lead Belly song, and it's, a, it's exactly what Lead Belly did. When you hear that song, and you hear that, oh, Black Betty, Ram -a oh, and you hear that, Ram -a because Lead Belly would get up and sing. Sometimes he wouldn't play the guitar. He would just do these chanty, almost like work song vocals with clapping. And here we have, over and over again, people selling millions of records. This goes right back to um, in the 50s, the Weavers recording um, Goodnight Irene goes straight to number one and selling two million records, you know. And uh, we see this over and over again, right? If you want to come right up to date and think, well, where's the influence now? Think of the British pop artist George Ezra and think of his voice. His voice has come directly out of Lead Belly. How do I know that? Because I can hear it. But also, George Ezra has stated that his vocal sound is, is, is modelled on by Lead Belly. So, this is an incredible legacy of a musician whose um, journey into the music industry was so strange. Now, what do, can we learn from this? Well, this is the real point I wanted to make on this video. Music and music history is made by individuals. Right, it's not made by movements, it's not made by historians, it's not great big groups of people. It's the idiosyncrasy of the individual, right? And their, their strange um, skill sets coming up with their strange journeys through life. In other words, when we track back to the moments where, you know, those sliding doors moments where something happened and it creates rock music or heavy metal or jazz or fusion, when we go back to those, those, those those 
um, events are actually quite strange as though the fate or the world has put together a number of you know occurrences that sort of squirt out this newness right and the reason that newness comes out is because it's based upon the genius of human beings individual human beings right and when um lead belly was standing up in the 1930s arguing for the rights of afro-americans against that oppression that was fundamentally arguing that they were individual entities right with the same rights as everybody else and should be treated as individuals okay and we hear that in the statement martin luther king said when he said you know ju judge someone not by the color of their skin by the content of their character now um as the 20th century has developed those ideas have sort of amalgamated around a bunch of other ideas and we have this idea now that we all belong to identity groups and those identity groups are sort of lined up in in order of privilege you know and you have the the unprivileged at the bottom and the super privileged at the top and right at the top are white people and they are white supremacy and right at the bottom are like sort of black lesbian trans people all down the bottom and we need to like we need to judge those people as individ uh, as a group and we need to put in um, ideas that will um, help that group cr create equity with the ones above. For me, that's exactly the opposite of what these musicians who were saying, stay woke to the injustice that's out there, right? Don't let them treat us like black people. Make them treat us like human beings. This is the shift. Right, I, I said I wasn't going to talk about this on the video, but couldn't help it. Um, Lead Belly um, was not a high morals, um, righteous person. He was an Afro-American who had been in the prison system. The great thing about social justice for me was the civil rights movement in the 60s, where people said that that people like that that had come from a different route uh, come from a different class come from a different race had really interesting things to say and um, the what they were saying was more important than who they were right we don't seem to um live by those rules anymore yes lead belly was a murderer yes lead belly was a musical genius but when he said that line, best stay woke, keep your eyes open, right? When he said that, that has a meaning that has echoed through the past 90 years. This is an incredible achievement, I think. Um, we all need to do that. We all need to keep our eyes open and stay woke, right? All of us do. We've got to spot when this stuff's happening. You know, when there's injustice, it needs to be called out and there is justice on both sides of the political spectrum okay i mentioned to kill a mockingbird on the right at the moment in florida they're trying to ban that book okay and then over on the left anybody that doesn't toe the idea ideological you know sort of identity politics line is not argued with or questioned they are shut down both sides are doing it we need to find a way of coming together now for me um, my love of Afro-American music, of jazz, of blues, of funk, right? That for me has always been, I have a love of, of, of the music of, of all sorts of different people. Um, and I, when I talk about Lead Belly, I cannot quite get across my respect, to, respect of him as a really, truly incredible artist. An incredible artist that achieved stuff that very few musicians do. And I want him to be judged like that, not as a black man, not as an Afro-American, not as a murderer, not any of that, right? I want him to be judged as an artist, as an individual, okay? Um, the system that he grew up in, right, the, the world that he lives in, we don't live in that world anymore, right? People can try and make out we do, but we don't. And the fact that he got, you know, channeled through the prison system is as much a testament to the system, the racist system that they had back then, okay? So um, I, th I think, you know, the beauty and the stories are incredible. 
So I'm really chuffed to be able to chat about Lead Belly um, and explain how these nuance events, all right, if Lead Belly had not shot his cousin and then gone into prison and frozen that knowledge, right, when he came out and he got signed by the record labels originally, he didn't have any success. And the reason is, is because they would only put out the blues recordings. And that wasn't where this, the worth was. It was in the folk recordings. And that him being able to take those ancient folk songs and then put them back out in the public influence a whole new generation of musicians. And that really is the, the underpinning and founding of rock music. It's that element coming into rhythm and blues that creates rock music. And we can really, um, you know, give props to Robert Johnson and Charlie Patton. These are all geniuses, but also to Lead Belly, who had such a unique journey um, through um, 20th century history. So I hope that was interesting to you. If you like this video, please like it. If you want to um, subscribe, press the subscribe button. And if you want to get press the noty bell notification button, you can. I've lost it now at the end of this, you know. <laughs> and uh, if you want to support me, you know, if you want to give me money for doing this and support me, go to my Patreon down there. I love the money, so please click on it. I've got like a hundred and something articles, videos, music, all sorts of stuff going on. With, you know, so come on over. So thanks for watching this video and I'll see you on the next one.